believe we're out of the ninth chapter. Oh my gosh. Tenth chapter of Hebrews. And grab your outline there, and your notes that are right there in the bulletin. I guess the bulletin is now just a glorified outline, I guess, of what we got. Matt, you snuck in. Oh, really? Is your wife here? No, she's home. We got home late. Okay. Okay. Well, good. I was asking people if anybody heard anything, and we didn't know. So everything okay? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. All right, brother. Well, we're glad you're back safe. We were praying for you all during this whole trip, you know. And okay. So Benjamin's graduated now. Yeah. yeah. What's the next step? Does he get to come home for a bit? No, it's Monday he starts. Oh, yeah. What's he going into? Uh, he's going to airborne. Oh, jumping out of a perfectly good airplane idea. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> See, Matt. See, people. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. You never. Oh, are you kidding me? Yeah, no, I, when I'm in a plane, it's like I'm strapped down, I'm in my chair. I mean, I get up and I go to the, you know, bathroom. But uh, this whole thing about, you know, like everything's okay, everything's not okay. Oh, we're up in a plane, what are you talking about? Okay. Well, we're glad you're back. I- extend uh, to Julie, you know, that we, we miss you guys and glad you're back. So, Hebrews, the 10th chapter. <clears throat> the first 10 verses. Here we go. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Therefore, when he, Christ, comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Christ speaking, Behold, I have come, in the scroll of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. After saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have had not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law, then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will... We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now, what we are now embarking on in this 10th chapter of Hebrews is a kind of a wrap-up of, of everything that he has said thus far, from at least chapter 1 through chapter 9. In fact, if you look down a little bit further, uh, he, you see some of that wrap-up, the, the therefore kind of thing, down in verse 19 of the 10th chapter. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter, and then he begins to talk about that, let us draw near, verse 22, so on and so forth. Uh, that the very critical passage. But it's a summarization of what's taking place here. Now, as you look at your outline, you see I've titled the teaching today, What the Law Cannot Do. Um, There are people, uh, not in our church, I don't think, but there are folks out there, Christians, um, who uh, get a little uptight when they hear something like that. What do you mean the law can't do something, you know, kind of a thing? And aren't we, shouldn't we still, okay, yeah, we're not saved by the law, but don't you think it's a good thing to, you know, that we should kind of do certain aspects of the law? It's it's good to follow after the law, you know, it's good to, but here's the problem with that. It's not biblical. It's just not biblical. The place of the law for the believer is fulfilled in Christ. He did it so we don't have to, because we never could. There's not an inkling of of an encouragement anywhere in Scripture that says you can keep the law. Because keeping the law means keeping all over 600 dictations of the ordinances of the law in the moral, sacrificial, and civil aspects of the law. There's over 600 of these things. And you've got to keep them all perfectly, because if you don't, then Galatians 3.10, Paul says, you're under the curse of the law. That's idiomatic. That's absolute. Okay? Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, don't think I came to what? 
destroy the law. I didn't come to ruin it. I came to what? Oh, fulfill it. See? And until heaven and earth pass away, which is a Hebraically understood, they all understood this back then when he told this to that Jewish audience, has to do with the old covenant as it was localized in the temple in particular. Till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle of the law will pass till it's all fulfilled. Well, guess what? He fulfilled it before heaven and earth passed away because that happened in AD 70. But when the veil was rent, when he said to telestai from the cross and the veil was rent in two, the debt is paid, it is finished. That, that, that is so ma- monumentally amplifying the fact that is the veil that says this is the representation of the law. You can come this farther, but you can't get any further to me. I'm God and I'm behind the veil. I'm in the Holy of Holies. But you can only get so far and that's it. Once that veil is rent, we are free. This is Galatians 5. It is for the sake of freedom that you are set free from the law. That's what the context is. It is for the sake of freedom that you are set free. Therefore, glorify God. And he talks on further like that. Even in Acts, the 15th chapter, uh, when uh, Paul and Barnabas were having it out with the Judaizers, many of these Judaizers, like it says in Galatians, were sent by James, who was over the Jerusalem council, Christian, uh, in, in Jerusalem. And Peter stands up and he says, listen, here's my, here's my conclusion on this entire matter of whether the Gentiles should now also be keeping the laws of Moses and being circumcised. Why would we put a yoke upon the Gentiles which neither we nor our fathers were able to bear? Now, is that not a summarization? Now, see, I'm with David. David said in, Psalm, in the Psalms, Lord, I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Me too. I'm so glad it's been fulfilled. That's my meditation all the day. Now, when David said that, it was before Christ came and fulfilled it. But you see, even Psalm 19 says, oh man, the law of the Lord, it's like honey, sweeter than the honey in the honeycomb. So, Yeah, it is. Romans 7, Paul says, the law is holy, just, and good. Yeah, it is. And, and I am not <laughs> outside of Christ. Uh, but those words don't mean, don't think for a second David's going, I keep the law. <laughs> they a snap. No. Look at David's life. Are you kidding me? Let's kill this man so I can have his wife, and then let's cover it up. And then I'll involve a general to, this is David. But David continuously was, and God's testimony about him was, he's a man after my own heart. Because David was one of the elect, and Christ gave him faith. David was regenerate, one of the few who were. And rather than getting sidetracked right there, the whole point is this. The law functions uh, for unbelievers to, to show them their sin and the absolute impossibility of being able to keep those laws. And even if, you were, even if you thought you had one law just absolutely down, you'll never be able to keep that one law. You won't be able to keep it consistently. Not a chance. And so when people say to me, well, you just think we ought to, you know, we're Christians and, and some people out there think, well, the law that has some sort of ongoing sanctification benefit or something like that. You know, once upon a time, I believe that. I thought it did. But God changed my mind as the years progressed, and the more I study, I'm going, oh my gosh, repent time. You know? Not only we have to see the law for exactly what it is as a believer post the cross. Christ, especially AD 70, but Christ has fulfilled. If something is fulfilled, it doesn't need to be redone. It doesn't need to be filled again or fulfilled again. It's done, fulfilled, over with, moving on now, moving on in the benefit of that fulfillment. So, in Luke 24, when after he's raised from the dead, he turns to the boys and he says, this is what I said, what I was talking about. He meant Matthew 5, 17 and 18, right? That I have fulfilled all things written about me in the law of the prophets and the Psalms. Now that means heavens and earth that he said he came to fulfill in Matthew 5.17. He just interpreted as the law of the prophets and the Psalms. Until heaven and earth pass away, all, not one jot or tittle, shall flake from the law till all is fulfilled. Well, that means I fulfilled everything that was written in the law of the prophet and the psalm. Law of the prophet and the psalm, heavens and earth, put them together, instant interpretation. Not two different contexts. He's talking about the same thing. The law was given to show us our sin, Romans 3.20, right? 
the, by the law is the knowledge of sin and other places. So what we need to do is focus in, in a sort of a wind-up routine here, what the law cannot do. Now, because he's writing this to Hebrew Christians who wanted to return to the temple. And all he's been doing is showing them how superior Christ is in, in, to all the things in the, and how it's, things have been fulfilled. But they still want to return to this sacrificial system, which, by the way, includes all of the other things, too. Don't segregate uh, the sacrificial system of the law apart from, let's say, the Ten Commandments. They all go together. The Ten Commandments do not stand alone. When somebody says, talks to you about the law, we should keep the law, most people think of the Ten Commandments. By the way, in Hebrew, or Exodus 20, it's the Ten Words. That's what it is. It didn't change the commandments, but okay, you can understand the same thing. That's just a small portion known as the moral law, but it's just a small portion of all of the law. It, it, when the Bible talks about keeping the law, it's talking about keeping all of it. So we need to, at this point, address in these verses what the law cannot do. You'll notice in your outline that as I've broken this open, the first thing I want to talk about is what the law cannot do for you. And we'll talk about that. Then secondly, what the law cannot do for God. And that's kind of eye-opening. When, when I was pulling this material out of the text, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, not only does it do nothing for God, when it comes to us being able to perform the law, even pre-Christ, God had to tolerate a lot of his own law because it's not what he wanted. It's not what he intended to take place. But he tolerated it to show men that they could not good work their way into his heaven. Fascinating. I think, I think God was more was happier than anybody else that the law had been fulfilled by his son, and now that's over with. Now that will tick a lot of people off, hearing something like that. <coughs> Third and finally, we'll talk about what the law cannot do, but only Christ can. Look at verse 1 together, and we'll see how that it cannot, first out the gate, complete or perfect you. The law has no ongoing ability to complete you, perfect you, bring you in any kind of righteousness. Verse 1, For the law, since it has only a shadow of good things to come and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make perfect, what? Those who draw near. See, it's just a shadow, like it says at the top right there. It's just a shadow of good things to come. Now, we saw this word once before in chapter 8 and verse 5. You can just make a note of it right there. Well, here it comes again, a shadow. The Greek is skia, skia. It's basically nothing more than a shade or a faint outline of a thing. In other words, it's a non-reality. It has no substance to it. So he says at the gate, the law is only a shadow. It is nothing substantive. In other words, yes, it's nothing physical, but it also is nothing substantive relative to what people use the law for in the Old Testament. To please God, to ultimately save themselves. But they never could. But God pressed it and pressed it, pressed it. Keep my commandments, do my laws, you'll come under my blessings. See? And why did he press it? Not because he had some idea that, oh, they can do this, but to demonstrate that they couldn't do it. That's the whole point that the New Testament explodes for us in regards to the explanation. So the law is just a shadow, but it's a shadow, it says, of good things to come. Good things that are to come. Uh, by the way, the Greek there for to come, that is mellow. We're used to, to hearing that, uh, especially in this church, and it shows up several times in the book of Hebrews. In this case, remember I've told you that there's a twofold meaning for mellow, and it depends upon the grammatical structure, construction that the word is found in. Uh, there is about to be definition, but there's also certainty. Um, when it is an about to be definition, then the verb mellow in the Greek text will have another verb following it in the infinitive mood. We do not have that construction here in verse 1 of chapter 10. Therefore, this word means certainty. It has a certainty aspect to it. So he's saying here, the law, this shadow of good things certainly to come, it pointed towards the things of Christ that had to be fulfilled. That's the good thing that, that is primary. The good things that come from that are from the aspect of Christ fulfilling the law. 
Well, see, that's why I bring up to you Luke 24, after Christ is raised from the dead, he goes to the guys and he says, I have fulfilled all that was written about me in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. And all the good things that come from that. One of the good things that comes right out of the gate is I'm free from having to keep it. Because faith in Christ fulfills it. Christ is my fulfiller, not me. Christ has done it. And that was God's intention from the beginning. God's intention was never that man would fulfill his law and thereby gain access into heaven. You will not find one scripture that substantiates that. Now, people who are prone to legalism, and I come across them every week, especially uh, uh, online stuff, people are writing more and more into uh, the website where we have that, the doctor is in, you know, page there. And then I'm responding to this, and then I get emails, and, you know, there's even people on Facebook that it, oh my gosh, without going into all the stories, I am aghast at the amount of really bad teaching and a lack of good sound teaching that is on there that continues to cripple Christians in this area. There's nothing more crippling than thinking that you have to perform a law to satisfy God for any reason, way, shape, or form. It's crippling. It's right up there with presuppositions. So, he says here that these this law being just simply a shadow, a non-reality, it points towards the good things that are certainly to be, is the way I would translate that. Uh, by saying it was pointing towards the, the good things to be, what do you suppose he was, had in mind right there? The law points towards the good things to be. Well, one of the things that it points towards is the result of the parousia, which he brings up in chapter 10 again, but it's verse 37 where he says, for just in a very, very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. So he, he, ta he tags us with that aspect, but then in chapter 13, the good things that are about to come, right? Uh, the good things, excuse me, that are certainly to come. And what is that? Well, Christ is coming. And as a result of that, what's, what's going to take place? Well, in chapter 13, he says, verse 14, for here, that is here in Jerusalem, we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. Notice the comparison. Here, Jerusalem, we don't have a lasting city. He's pointing at the fact of, Jesus already taught us about the Olivet Discourse. Jesus already taught us that this temple, not one stone will be left standing on another. And Jesus already taught us, end of Matthew 23, throughout Matthew 24, that the sign of his parousia, his second appearing, if you will, which we talked about last week, Hebrews 9.27, will be the destruction of this temple. When heaven and earth pass away, but my words will not pass away. Heaven and earth, the law inculcated within the temple structure right there, temporary. My words, eternal. See? Why do you want to go back to that, which just was temporary, has no foundation in salvific biblical revelation relative to what I just said, salvific, soteriology, your salvation. It has nothing relative to that other than just exposing you to the need of being saved by grace. That's what the law does. It's what it always has done. Year in, year out. See, But when he says here, I just think this is fascinating, when he says here that this law in verse 1 of chapter 10, good things to come, a shadow, but it's not the very form of things. See that? It's not the true representation of things. It's a shadow. It has no substance. It can never, can never, ever, by the same sacrifices, same sacrifice, sacrifice again, 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 which they offer continually, year by year by year. It can never make perfect those who draw near to him. Never. Now, the word there for perfect at the bottom of the, of the verse, that's teleo. Uh, that's to complete, perfect, to bring to a state of completeness. It can never, by those sacrifices, year in and year out, make anybody 
Perfect. Now, now sometimes this trips up people because they say, well, you know, yeah, I'm not talking about, look, Burks, I'm not talking about, you know, uh, killing a, a, a ram or a lamb. I'm not talking about a blood sacrifice here. I'm talking about just doing the Ten Commandments. You don't get it still, do you? You still don't get it. You can't, you can't disassociate one law from all the other laws. They are a package deal. They come together. You won't find any Bible that teaches that the law is a series of law that are separated from all the other laws. They're all interconnected. See, So when he talks about the sacrificial system, what's the sacrificial system uh, based on? It's based on the entire revelation that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai during a 40-day period when he was up there receiving all over 600 of these laws. Moses... God didn't, see, we get, it's MGM does this to us, okay? Uh, Moses didn't walk down, you know, with a couple of tablets sort of routine, uh, you know, and nothing else. There were ten basics, and there were other laws that were all on tablets, okay? Uh, uh, he received everything up there, and then he had to write down everything that was, he had to write all this stuff down. That was good. <laughs> But we think that's what he came down with. No, he came down with everything that you read about in Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And there's a lot of repetition in those books of the same things, too. Okay, That's what he comes down with. Year by year, year by year, I'm, I'm not bearing false witness. Year by year, I'm keeping the Passover. Year by year, I'm, if I've got a house with a, you know, you know, a, a flat roof on top, I've got to build that that parapet all the way around that fence. That's a law. Did you know that? Year by year. And I could go on naming other laws. Everything comes under this year by year thing. The sacrificial system was a part of the whole. So year by year, <clears throat> they can never make the offerer perfect or perfect the one who draws near. Look, look back at chapter 7 for a second. And look at verse uh, 18 through 19. Chapter 7 of Hebrews, verses 18 through 19. Watch this. For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of a former or the former commandments. It's in toles, it's plural. Because of its weakness and uselessness. That's, that's the inspired writer's commentary on the commandments of law that he's talking about in this context. He says, it's weakness and it's useless. I didn't say that. Hebrews 7, uh, verse 18 said that. Why? Because Christ already fulfilled all that was written of him in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. Christ already, I did not come to destroy the law, I came to fulfill. Verse 19. For the law made nothing. What? It never completed anything. It never was intended to, ladies and gentlemen. The law made nothing perfect. Oh, but on the other hand, verse 19 says, a bringing in of a better hope, there's that word better again, did through which we draw near to God. And that's why Hebrews 10, 22 says, as a result of what Christ has done, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled. See all that Hebrew analogy right there. Let's draw near. Christ has done it. From the cross, it is finished. To tell us, die, the debt is paid. Rip! Draw near. Draw. It's done. It's over. Well, don't you think the law... I will return to drinking. No, I, I really won't, but... <laughs> Baby. Chapter 9, verse 8. Chapter 9, verse 8, the Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place had not yet been disclosed, while the outer tabernacle still had standing, which is a symbol for the present time, first century. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. Cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. You know what can? Chapter 10, verse 14 can. For by one offering... By one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. We'll talk about that grammatical form next week, Lord willing. But notice, by one offering, he has perfected forever. Wait a minute, wait a minute. If I'm perfect forever because of my righteousness that has been imputed to me from Christ, because of his work, 
and I embrace it by faith, why do I need to keep your law? Why do you turn around and say, do I, do I have to be... Maybe there's a, a separate standard of perfection in your, your world of Christianity. Maybe you've got your basic perfection plan. Maybe you've got your ultra-perfection plan. But if you want my platinum perfection plan, <laughs> yeah, for the rest of your life, just follow these laws. I even had somebody, you, you've probably had it too. People will say to you, well, I don't believe that uh, you, you can be justified by keeping the law. That's a, but now that we are justified, now that we are saved, we can be even better law keepers. They used to think that too. But as you can see, as we've been going through this, as we go through Romans, as we go through Galatians, as we go through Hebrews, that idea doesn't have a leg to stand on. So, the law cannot complete or perfect you. Look at subpoint B under the first heading. It also cannot clear your conscience. Verse 2 now. Otherwise, right? If it could make us perfect to draw near, otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins. See, the continuous repetition, the continuous repetition of having to sacrifice, keep a law, keep a law, keep a law, listen now, the continuous repetition of that means it never works. It never takes that's why it has to be done again, 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 again. See, the law is a hard, harsh taskmaster. Its whip with its barbs and its broken glass and its hooks and its lacerating razors cut in deep, regular, and they do their job. It's very efficient. It is the primary guilt provider of all of life. The righteous standards of God, when confronted by imperfect sinful man, man dies. That's why 2 Corinthians 3.6 says the law kills. The law sticks it in and turns it and twists it. But it's the spirit that gives life. Oh, don't talk to me about any of that charismatic spirit stuff. It's the spirit that gives life. The law kills. It's the spirit that gives life. What's he talking? Now that Christ has been crucified, has been raised from the dead, he has sent the Holy Spirit, and now Paul says to the Galatians, to the Ephesians, to the Romans, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the law of the a lust of the flesh. By the way, I, I sort of misspoke, but I really didn't right there because I'm convinced that the first part of first half of Romans the 8th chapter when he talks about the flesh that is, a, that is a, a, an equilateral substitution word for the law that he brings up in the exact same context. See, for a believer, to keep the law is an act of the flesh. <laughs> so it can't clear the conscience. Otherwise, would it not have ceased to be offered? The word there for cease, by the way, is pao. It means to make a dead stop. It's to hit the brakes. It's come to a screeching halt. If, these, if the law, with its sacrificial system, could perfect you, uh, but it can't because by the very fact that it has to be repeated continuously, says it's never effectual to do that. See, But if it could, you know, then it should never have, it should cease. It should, they should have stopped doing it. But the, the work against that is the fact um, that uh, the conscience is still aware of, of its own sinfulness. But in Christ, in Christ, the Scripture gives us the basis to kick the, the conscience relative to my sins, whether I committed them 50 years ago, 5 years ago, 5 days ago, 5 minutes ago, 5 seconds ago, my conscience is clear once I confess. And I am clean. The discipline that us Christians have to exercise is that we tend to not let ourselves be whole. We tend to not really receive that forgiveness from the Lord. Because 1 John 1, you've heard it a gazillion times, because I have said it a gazillion and now a gazillion and one time. Confess your sins. He's what? Faithful and just or righteous to 
forgive your sins, and, the Greek is present tense, go on cleansing you. From what? All unrighteousness. Perceived unrighteousness and otherwise. See? What do you think Jesus meant when he said, if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. See, the indeed right there is like, oh baby, oh baby. You are truly free. It doesn't get more free than this. When somebody is free from a guilty conscience and the mental racking that people go through that we've all gone through from time to time, and some people do, when you're free from that, it is like the burden of the world has come off from your shoulders. You can really go now. You can really live that life that Christ came to give. I came to give life and that life more abundantly. Spiritually as well as physically because the great abundance of physical life uh, has its root in the spiritual reality, the spiritual substitutionary work that Christ has wrought for us that lets us go, see, in life. If the offers, verse 2, having once been cleansed, they would no longer have had consciousness from sin. See, all the old covenant uh, animal sacrificial system could do was just to put off or delay judgment. That's all it could do. See, atonement had the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, had to happen once a year, right? And that basically, as I've explained to you in the past, covers the nation of Israel, puts it under a blanket, as it were, for the year. But it has to be repeated every year. And in between those major Yom Kippur offerings, there has to be individual sin blood offerings, doesn't there? For individual sins. Then, but, but atonement is the basis for the, for the entire, but all it can do, kafar, atone, what does it mean? Kafar, to cover. All it can do is cover. Atonement is a cover-up. It's just a cover-up. It's never meant to cleanse. It can't cleanse. It's not able to cleanse. So he says right here in verse 2, um, if they could, coming off of verse 1, make the worshiper perfect or complete who draws near, then they should have been stopped. But see, what is he battling with? He's battling with this idea that these Hebrews and Christians are thinking that they're more, they're more holy, they're more right with God, they're more cl clean, um, they like it more. Really, that's what it comes down to. You know why people like the law? Why Christians want to be law keepers? Because they like a set of rules to follow. They like a set of exterior standards. That's the problem. That's why Paul refers to this as flesh. For a Christian to, to walk or keep the law, according to Paul in Romans 8, is flesh. Don't argue with me about this. Now, I'm not saying that to you. I'm saying it to the benefit of everybody else who is listening to this, who likes to write back to me and take up a bunch of my time. And by the way, if you don't hear from me, it's because we're done talking. I've told you what I've told you, and that's the end of that. If you want more, then you can come here and talk to these people in this church. Uh, they can tell you probably as much as I can tell you. I'll give you their names and numbers if you like. No, I can't do that. <laughs> Except for one. Frank wants to talk to all of you. <laughs> and Frank's number is 402 Okay. Good night, nurse. I cannot believe this. So, it only makes sense. Uh, the worshipers would have no more consciousness of sin. Oh, by the way, what is unconsciousness? Unconsciousness. We know what unconscious is, right? If somebody gets knocked out, we say they're unconscious. unconscious. Now, while that person is down for the count, as it were, they're unconscious on the road, are they aware of what's going on around them? Nope. Has anybody here ever been knocked out unconscious? It's kind of a, I, I understand, it's just like there's nothing much going on. It's kind of a dark hole of sorts. What did you experience? Uh, a car accident. Yeah. And, but a, pa a passage of time is now missing, isn't it? From the time of the, the, the hit until the, the time you wake up. See, that's my point. When somebody is unconscious, they're not aware of what's going on around them. They're not aware. Uh, here he uses that word in the bottom of verse 2 or that phrase that if these, uh, if these things were effectual, if these, the law with its sacrifices was effectual, then we should have had no longer any consciousness or awareness of our sins. But that's the problem. It's only the blood of Christ that makes you, listen, unconscious of your sins. 
Now, that does not mean suddenly I don't remember the sins that I've committed. I remember plenty of sins that I've committed. So do you. That is, you remember your own sins. Well, you may remember my sins too. I don't know. Okay? But, but, but that's my point right there. It means that it has no more hold on you. There is no guilt factor going on any longer. That's why I love chapter 9, verse 14. Take a look at it again. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works, freeing you, is the idea, to serve like a priest the living God. Isn't that fabulous? Freeing you to serve the living God. Chapter 10, verse 17. 10, 17. And their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. I mean, it just gets better and better. You all know Philippians 3.13. Paul says to the believer, forgetting what is behind. Forget it. Reach now towards what is before you. Press towards the mark of the high, like a runner, towards the mark of the high prize of the calling of God in Christ. Forget the past. You know, it's like a weight. In fact, the writer of the Hebrews in the 12th chapter, he's going to use that analogy of a runner who has weights on his feet. You know? We'll, we'll wait till we get there, okay? But you can't run the race with weights on your feet. He uses the same analogy. Paul, rather, I should say, uses the same analogy in Galatians. I think it's the fourth chapter, where he says, man, you're like a bunch of runners. I'm writing to these Galatian Christians, and the Judaizers have come in trying to bring a syncretism between grace and law. Well, they don't, they don't work. They cancel each other out. You can't have both working simultaneously. You cannot have a believer under grace and trying to be uh, further law-keeping and some uh, idea of, of sanctifying oneself progressively. It doesn't work that way. It's a walk in the Spirit. The laws are written in our hearts. We just got through studying it in the 8th chapter of Hebrews. He's going to bring it up again in this chapter. What does it mean to have the law written on your hearts? It means that you are a new creation now. You are automatically pleasing to God. Through the substitutionary work of Christ, He gives you the gift of faith and repentance. You come running to Him, and you are automatically pleasing to Him because of Christ. That is the superiority of the substitute work of Christ on the cross. Now, there is not one law that I have to keep that will make me any more acceptable to God or any more pleasing to Him in fact, if I started to try to keep a law, it would assume that, I, that the work of Christ on the cross, and here's for all you law keepers out there, was insufficient in some way. You cannot have both. Romans 3.20 says, By the works of the law, no flesh will be saved. You won't be saved from your sins, and you won't be saved from the guilt of your past either. doesn't work that way. Psalm 103.12, as far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. You all know what that means, right? Do I have to explain it again? As far as the east is from the west, you guys know what that means, okay? He has removed our transgressions from us. And then there's Isaiah 38.17, he has cast all of my sins behind his back. Isaiah 38.17, you know what that means? God's not looking at him. He says, you say, Lord, remember when I sinned that sin? Nope, can't see it. It's all gone. That was all Isaiah 38, 17. That's in, that was a prophecy in preparation of the fulfillment of Christ. Otherwise, it can't happen. See? I mean, I could go on. I know you know most of these things, but the refresher, the refresher is always good. And so, verse 2, man, <laughs> we go back into law keeping in some way. Well, the problem is, is that I remain conscious of my sins. That's the problem. But only Christ cleanses my conscience from those works of death. By the way, when I gave you that teaching in Hebrews 9.14, those dead works right there, that's in relationship to the context of law in his subject right here that was going on. Oh my gosh. So it can't do any of that stuff. We see that what the law can't do for me, it can't complete me, it can't clear my conscience of my guilt. Uh, thirdly, it cannot take away my sins. And we see that pretty simply in verses 3 and 4. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. There is a uh, anamonesis in Greek. Uh, there is this repeated remembrance, or it's like setting up a memorial. 
How'd you like? How'd you like me now, knowing that I counsel you, you guys in regards to I know about your stuff. Now I don't know everything about you because you don't tell me everything about you. You know, but most pastors know some pretty damning stuff, right? How about that? Uh, since you want to be a law keeper, how about I take what I know about what you've done, and I build this sign, I set up this memorial, and we'll just put it in the foyer. I won't put it on the roof of the church, but anybody that comes into the church, well, so and so did this. And this, and this, and this, and this. Would you like that? Yeah. You sure? It gave you lots of attention. Mm-hmm. See? <laughs> See, nobody wants... But that's what he's saying here, is that when you try to keep the law as a believer, all you're doing is memorializing your sins. It says in verse 3, but in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins year by year. See, there's no, nothing cleansing about law-keeping. You can't separate the sacrificial system from the rest of the law system. It's all one system. Verse 4, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Folks, it was never possible. Never possible. All they could do was point towards the coming one, Christ, who could do it. Until then, sins and judgment for them is just what? It's held in abeyance. It's just held off. That's all it is, what he's talking about right here. So the question to the Hebrew Christians then would be what? Why do you want to return to it? Why do you want to return to this then? That's the problem. Moving on to point number two. What the law cannot do now, what the law cannot do for you, now what it cannot do for God. Oh, this is his law. I thought this was his thing. I thought it pleased him if we kept the law. Yeah, if you could, it would please him. But you can't, so it won't. That's Paul's theme in the second chapter of Romans, uh, verses 6 and 7, which I don't want you to go to. I'm just having you having you relate to that right now. A lot of a lot of Reformed people have looked at that stuff and says, hey, man, if you do good things and righteous works, you know, then God will give you, you know, eternal life. That would be, you know, but the problem is, is that he's pointing out in that context right there uh, that if you could do these things, God would, but you can't, so he won't. You never could. Because Romans 3, verses 10 through 12, especially verse 12, says there's none who does good. And just in case you think you might be the exception to that, he says, no, not one. Not even you, baby. Not even the person you think is so holy and righteous. They can't do it either. Well, if, if Romans 2, verse 6 says those who by doing good seek righteousness, they get eternal life. But then he turns around and says in 3.12, there's none that does good, not even one. What's, then what does he mean in chapter 2 of Romans, verses 6 and 7? He means that if you could, he would, but you can't, so he won't. It's not the basis for any ongoing progressive sanctification, let alone salvation in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't work that way. What the law cannot do for God, look at verse 5. And we've already been through this, by the way. I've already taught you about verse 5 and 6, so I'm just going to go over this and move along. Uh, Therefore, when he, that is Christ, comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole bird offerings and sacrifices for sins, you have taken no pleasure. Now, of course, all this is out of Psalm 40. And this is primarily a Septuagint-like, close to, but not perfect, Septuagint-like quote um, out of the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament. I know that you know that, something that was very popular in the first century. All right, Verses 5 through 7 here is important because it's Christ speaking. It's Christ speaking, and Christ is addressing God in regards to the context of, I'm going to be the sacrifice, so I need a, a body. Now, in the Hebrew, Psalm 40, verse 6, you like that? It was kind of a little dance I did. I, I, had a, I, I feel all right, you know, but on occasion, maybe I breathe too hard. Oh, I know what it is. I got a, a deacon, Lynn. Could we just shut that? I'm like, I'm cooking up here. I'm medium rare. Put a por- fork in me. Why don't you take your jacket off? <laughs> no, I didn't hear what I thought I just said. Tony Keith's not here, so you're my witness. Charges may have to be yeah, brought up. You write it down? Okay. Uh, 
Ah! Ah, I need you to do that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, all right, so back to this. Verse 5, Therefore, when he comes into the world, Christ is declaring, and then he quotes out of, out of uh, Psalm 40 right here. By the way, I need to say that in the Hebrew, Psalm 40, verse 6, it's the word ears. The phrase is, uh, My ears thou hast opened. What, what you've got right here is people say, Why is there a difference right here? How come the Hebrew says ears, My ears thou hast opened? But over here in Hebrews 10, 5, it says, A body you have prepared for me. This is basically what's known as a, a, it's a synecdoche. You probably know what that is. Where one part, in this case, is being replaced with another. But you can't have one without the other. Uh, bodies have ears. Okay? The idea of, in Hebrew thinking is that the ear, this is the place that receives the direction, the command from God. This is the organ that uh, is first step in obedience. You see, And with the body... With the body, then, I fulfill what God asked me to do. So the ears you have opened, the ear is the organ that receives the command from God to obey. The body, then, is the vehicle of obedience resulting in Christ's bodily sacrifice. That's the basic rundown of what you're, you're seeing here in regards to the difference between the wording of Hebrews 10.5 of Psalm 40, verse 6, and the Hebrew, which in your English Bible, Psalm 40, verse 6, will say, my ears thou hast opened or my ears thou hast dug out. That's, that's the basic meaning that's going on right here. It's a synecdoche that's taking place. I got that from John Owen, Puritan monster, and I think that's absolutely right. Now, when I spoke to you about this before, when he comes into the world, this is Christ speaking, this is talking about his virgin conception. This is talking about in the womb of, the Mar of Mary. This is how he came into the world. God had to prepare a body for him. Why? because of the Adamic tainting. You know, already know about this. There can't be anything of the sperm, uh, the male sperm involved with Christ uh, being conceived, nor can there be anything of the egg of Mary. This is another hill I have died on. You're looking at a real theological corpse up here. I've died on so many hills, it's ridiculous. But I'm committed to this. I'm at a point, look, I'll be 55 in May. And I started studying the Bible seriously when I was 16. So I've been at this for a little bit. Um, I think I'm at a point in my life after all these degrees and writing books and, and blah, 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 and just teaching the Word, you know, year in and year out kind of a thing, that I ought to be able to come to some conclusions about some things, even if they run contrary and against the grain of, of some other people. I'm sorry, but I'm the one that has to stand before the Lord. And my conscience is absolutely clear. See? Now, is it possible that I could be wrong? Yeah, it's possible that I could be wrong. It's possible that you could be wrong, too. So look, at, stare at yourself for a while in your own theological mirror and then get back to me. The problem with that is that some of us are just overly enamored with who we are and like to stare back at, you know, and we never really get at the truth of anything. <coughs> so when he says this, he says that in the light of he came into the world, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins you have taken no pleasure. This body has been perfectly prepared. Katartizo, it says right here. This body has been prepared. But in verse 6, he goes back to the idea that he already presented in verse 5 that God never really wanted sacrifice, sacrifice and offering through animal blood because it doesn't get it. It doesn't satisfy it. It's a, the animal blood can never save. It, it has no salvific value. It had none in the Old Covenant. It certainly, obviously, has none today. In fact, it's a blasphemy. Uh, to, to try to fire that up today because it's a direct slap at Christ. It says that his work on the cross was insufficient. It speaks and mitigates and directly contradicts the power of the blood of Christ. See. Verse 6 says, In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken what? No pleasure. Eudokeo can mean to please, pleasure. It can also mean to choose. You didn't choose this. God established it, but it wasn't his choice relative to this is the answer. Certainly wasn't his first choice, but this is a type of that which is to come. See? And we find out as we move along right to verse 7, you look at subpoint B right there, that this cannot accomplish God's will. The law can't, this is what the law can't do. It, it can't accomplish God's will. Look at verse 7 now. Then I said, Christ still speaking, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Now, if you have a New American Standard or something along those lines, 
you should have the words in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. Uh, it, that that's uh, I just forgot the word. It's in a uh, it's para parenthetical. parenthetical. Thank you. I was going to say paraphrastic. That's wrong. Thank you, my brother. I'm, one of the elders has got it together. Parenthetical. It's in a parenthesis sort of idea, okay? Because it's a thought that's within a thought right here. Christ is saying it. He's, but here's the primary uh, phrase that he's saying to God. Behold, look, 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 pay attention. I have come. It's the announcement. It's the announcement of the ages. God prepared a body for me, Christ is saying, and I have come now. To do what? Bottom of seven. To do your will, O God. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I love that. There are so many Old Testament passages, of course, that point us to um, Christ prophetically coming in different ways, where he would be born, what he would do, what, what his actions would be, his resurrection and, and the cross and all this. You know, a, rather than doing that, let me just have you note some New Testament passages I'm kind of moving along here, so let me have you note some New Testament passages you can write down um, where it's the New Testament saying that Christ has fulfilled all that was written about him in the Old Testament. Luke 24, verse 27. Luke 24, verse 27, and verse 44. Luke 27, tw excuse me, 24, 27, and 44. Acts 10, verse 43. Acts 10, verse 43. John 5, verse 39. John 5, verse 39. By the way, that last one is really great. Christ is speaking to the Jewish religious leaders, and he says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But they are those that testify of me. Whoa! Jesus is saying it's all about me. See, it's not just portions out of the Old Testament. You know, uh, when I did my my master's my master's degree classes and got my my THM, my um, master's thesis was a, a Christology of the Bible. It's ridiculous. You know, my my prof my professor, my degree professor, had me on this long trip finding Christ from Genesis to Revelation. And I've got in my library, I've got all the bound volumes. They're like this. It's on a stack, you know, this, this much of all the writing that I did. But it was so beneficial to me, seeing Christ everywhere. Obviously, there are places, you know, where you, don't, you could get fanciful about it because he's not absolutely in every verse. But all the major themes are about Christ and many minor themes as well, see. So, fabulous stuff. But New Testament passages that refer to Christ coming, he says here in verse 7, in the scroll of the book, it is written of me, but it is to do your will, O God. Now, I'll come back to that idea. Uh, verse 8 now. After saying above, and then he requotes, you know, basically verses 5 and 6, sacrifice offering, whole bird offering, and sacrifice for sins, you have not desired nor have taken pleasure in them. That's pretty straight up, isn't it? God does not, even in the Old Testament, God is saying this. You know, I, I really don't want this. It's not what I want. It's not what I want. Um, by the way, make a note of Micah 6, verses 6 through 7. Uh, God is, is basically saying there in Micah 6, verses 6 through 7, I don't want this. I really don't want this. There's more than one place we've seen that talks about this. This was not his goal. This was not his by all and end, not his end game, not his plan to have the law moving forward like this that would either save or bring to pass any sort of ongoing sanctification. But notice at the bottom of verse 8 right here that all this stuff is offered according to the law. See, God simply tolerated this stuff. And that's what you'll see in Micah 6, verses 6 through 7. Fastest second point I've ever been through in my life. Third point, here we go, hit the gas. Here's what the law cannot do. Can't do for you, can't perfect you, can't do anything for God, doesn't do anything for Him. But what the law can't do, only Christ can do. And here we, we get it right here, the last two verses. Only Christ can uh, do and establish the will of God. That's first and foremost. Verse 9. Then He, Christ, said, Behold, I have come to do your will. Obviously commenting back on verse 7. Behold, I have come to do your will. Now, the author takes over. He takes away the first 
in order to establish the second. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. To do your will. That was Christ's main theme when he came to the earth. He is the most <laughs> doing of the will of God guy that was ever alive on the face of the planet. Nobody did the will of God more consistently, absolutely perfectly, than Christ did. And he kept stating that theme over and over. He'd state it to the boys. You know, that was very powerful when he'd state that theme, <coughs> doing God's will. Like, for instance... <clears throat> excuse me, in John 4, 34, we're studying this on Wednesday nights right now, where he meets up with the Samaritan woman at the well, remember all that? And, and the boys come and they're, and they're going, Master, you know, they come back from going into the village to get something to eat, you talk a bell dripping from their mouth, and they go, oh, something to eat, something to eat. And Jesus says, I have food to eat of that you don't know anything about. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and finish it. That's what drove him. That's why we're saved today. That's why we have this magnificent Savior. Because he was driven by one thing and one thing only. To do the will of God like hunger would drive you to eat. He was driven within to finish what God had given him to do. There was no danger of him not doing it <coughs> in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's like, take this cup from me. But he always said, not my will, but, your, but yours be done. I don't want to bear and become sin. I don't want to bear somebody's sickness, but I'll do it. I'll do it. He said he would do it because he loved it. He was sold off to the will of the Father. He was in 100% agreement. See, Only the second person of the Godhead could do this, could do the will of the Father. See, How about chapter 5 of John and verse 30? You can just write these down. John chapter 5, verse 30. John 6, verse 38. John 6, verse 38. There are other passages, but those are three primary passages right there that speak about Christ was after nothing more than to do the will of his Father. And we're told to follow after him in that way, to seek God for his will. What's his will? His word is his will. It's right here. It's in front of you. It's on your lap. You can never do the will of God if you don't know what the will of God is. You can't perform the job if you don't understand what the job is. If you've never been trained, you know, uh, in aerotech space technology, well, gosh, then you can't do the job. It means you can't perform the will of those who have hired you to be this geek. I've come to do your will, O oh God. Now, I love the rest of this. I'm going to do this quick. He says in verse 9, Behold, I have come to do your will. Now, he makes the statement, He takes away the first in order to establish the second. Take your pencil and go from the word first in verse 9 back up to the last word in verse 8. There it is. There's your connection. He takes away the first, which is the law, right? In order to establish the second. The word second goes to the middle of verse 9 where you find the word will. To establish the will of God, to make the will of God stand, Meaning, I'm the sacrifice, Jesus says. When I came into the world, God prepared, perf cut our tizo, perfectly prepared a body for me. Perfectly, see? So that I could be the sacrifice. So, I've got to, in order to establish the will of God, which is my sacrifice, my being the substitute, we've got to get rid of the law. We've got to take it away. And that's what he does. Taking it away means I fulfilled it. This is Matthew 5, 17 and 18. I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. Ah! That's what Luke 24 is talking about. Verse 44. For guys, he's resurrected from the dead. He's just been back from the cross. He's fulfilled the law. I have fulfilled everything that was written about me in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. This is big news. See? This is the basis for the preaching. Well, if he's fulfilled it, what can the law do for me? Nothing. You know, the law doesn't even function for the Christian anymore. You know why? You know why? Because you have the righteousness of Christ imputed to you, charged to your account. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says you're the righteousness of God in Christ. You, you don't get any more righteous than Christ. Hello? You're it. By faith. The law doesn't even work for you anymore. The law doesn't... In fact, I'm going to go so far as to say along with Paul, you can even ignore it. Why? Because it's written inside you. 
You can ignore it. You're being led by the Spirit, and the Spirit will never contradict the moral commands of the law. Huh? What? What? Why do I need an external guide? Why do I have to take you over to Exodus, the 20th chapter, and say, Commandment number one, He is the only God. Commandment number two, why do I have to do that? You already know all that. That forms the basis for you to understand the New Testament, which is infinitely more important than the Old Testament. I didn't say it wasn't less inspired. They're both inspired. They have their function and their purpose. But this is a whole other deal here. So, he, in order for him to do, his, to do the will of God, he takes away the law, that's what first is referring back to, in order to establish, to make stand, the second, which is God's will. And, verse 10, by this will, by the will of God, which is what? For Christ, for whom he prepared a body for, to come and sacrifice. You know what? And when he said, that's it, to tell us die, I believe... I don't think God sent an angel. He certainly didn't have some guy do it because the excuse me, the veil in the temple was a hand's breadth thick, intricately woven material, and the weight of this thing was ridiculous. You couldn't even cut through it with a skill saw. Unless you had the super platinum version skill saw with the blade that's out to here, kind of a routine, you know? But I believe God himself did it. I believe the Father did it. Go ahead, fight me about this. Do what you tell. What? <laughs> it was his thing. He's been waiting for this. He has tolerated all of this law and sacrifice. And oh yeah, there's the blood. There goes another lamb. There goes another ram. And no one is any closer. Their sins were held. Judgment for their sins are held in abeyance. Just held off. That's it. Why do you think people didn't go to heaven in the old covenant? Why do you think that Jesus? relates to the fact, like in Luke 16, that righteous men and women who were looking forward to the coming of Messiah, when they died, they went to Sheol. They went to the compartment called Abraham's bosom. Then nobody ever went. John, the first chapter, says, or third chapter, excuse me, said, no man, Jesus said, has ever gone into heaven except me. No man has up to that point in Revelation history. Because the law was still in play. All the law could do was holding. It's a holding, holding off their sins. Can't let you into heaven yet because no matter how, how tight and good you were and basically righteous, you know, from the human standpoint, relative to keeping my laws, it's not good enough. You, I, I'm keeping you safe over here. I'm keeping you, I can't let you into heaven yet. But once Christ comes, that changes. That changes. Because Ephesians 4 says that when Christ died and was buried, it said that he descended into Sheol, and he emptied, this is Ephesians 4, uh, verses 8 through 10, and he emptied the, the uh, compartment of Sheol, which is Abraham's bosom, and then at his ascension, it says that he took those people, I don't know how this works, I just know this what it says, and he ascended, he, t he took those people out of there and took them up into heaven with him ascended, led a great train of captives. They were captive down uh, in, the, in Sheol, in Abraham's bosom. Now the rest got left there until the great white throne judgment of AD 70. Incredible. Why? That's testimony to what the law couldn't do, but what Christ could. Only Christ can perform the will of God in sanctifying us, and only Christ can do all this once and for all. Verse 10, by this will, we have been, now we're not waiting for it, we have been sanctified, made holy, set apart unto God. No law can do this. Through the keeping of the law, right? Through the, uh, the constant, continuous, repetitious, keep, no. Through, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus, which said body was perfectly created for him. Once, just once, and for all time. Not year by year by year, let's sacrifice again, let's keep another law. Year by year, in and out, back and forth. No, gone, gone, gone as of A.D. 30. That's the power of the cross. The cross 
fulfills all the law and makes the basis for propitiation Christ's substitute for me so I can go to heaven and be in the Holy of Holies with Papa so I can jump up on his lap? No Jew thought in these terms. Jump up on God's lap? Blasphemy! You shouldn't even be saying the word God. Shut up! Shut up! He's my dad! The cross made all this possible. Now the resurrection, the empty tomb, that's something different. A.D. 70, with the second coming, something else. A lot of preterists out there get this wrong. And I can, I can speak to this because I, I was in on it from the, from the basic beginning <laughs> with all of this stuff. Uh, your preterists are wrong if you think the law was fulfilled by Christ in A.D. 70. The temple was destroyed. That was the last corpse of Judaism to go down. That's it. But the law was destroyed, or rather I should say fulfilled, on the cross, April of A.D. 30. Why? Because when he said to Telestai, yeah, when he said it, what happened? The veil rent. Access to God. Bang! Wide open. So what's the deal, folks? The deal is, is that this law can't do nothing <laughs> except expose your sin. And that's, that's what it's supposed to do. See, That's why it's so important to understand Galatians 3, verse 24, verse 25. The law was our schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. What? That's not good enough for you? You just don't... You, you know, when it's not good enough for certain people, they don't want to get it because they like the litigiousness. They want, to, they want to hold it up to you so they can feel righteous relative to up against your supposed unrighteousness. But you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Christ looks at me, he sees, or rather, God the Father looks at me, he sees Jesus. When he looks at you, he sees his Son. That's it. That's it. Well, let me do about five more verses. Oh, I'm done. Shock factor. Father, we just give you praise and thanks for all that you have shown us and do continue to show us in your word. Lord, thank you that you took care of all the law, fulfilled it all on the cross, and heaven and earth have passed away since then. Thank you, Lord God for this incredible truth. And may uh, my brothers and sisters here in Messiah Church, as well as all those who are listening to this, may they be truly set free from, like Peter said in Acts chapter 15, from this yoke of bondage that neither we nor our fathers could bear. Thank you, Lord God, for the freedom that Christ has given us. Freedom from sin and freedom in the knowledge that I'm going to be with the Lord when I die, that nothing can interrupt that. Nothing can interrupt that. According to your absolute sovereign good pleasure and design, nothing's going to interrupt that. And we just ask, Lord God, that you would help us to truly walk that out by thy powerful Holy Spirit. We believe that it will ha continue to happen, and thank you for it. And I just ask, Lord, that as we leave this place, Lord God, um, that you would be filling our hearts with resolve and with thankfulness that it's all done. It's all done. And now I just walk in accordance with the Word. Walk in accordance with Thy Spirit. And right now, Lord, as we, as we take up the morning offering and do this last act of worship right here, um, that as we do that, Lord, we would be free to follow uh, the Holy Spirit speaking to each one of us. I thank You for the freedom that there is in regards to that. And uh, may we seek to bless You now as we take care, Lord God, of the basic matters of the church. Thank you, Lord, for it all. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.